What's up, y'all? Hope you're doing excellent. We're looking at the Miao Viaduct, the world's tallest bridge. This was featured in a video long ago. I think uh, I was looking at a video about like the zero euro banknotes or souvenirs, whatever. And uh, this was in there. This is months ago. So this has been on the, uh, the burner for a long time here. Just from the couple pictures I saw, looked absolutely spectacular. So we're going to learn a little bit about the world's tallest bridge that happens to be in Europe, uh, specifically France. This is from Mega Projects. We link down below. Check them out. Here we go. In the early 1960s, a cynical British commentator remarked that a motorway could be defined as the shortest distance between two traffic jams, and that cynical dude was absolutely correct. In the 1980s, <laughs> France had a slightly different problem. Two motorways from opposite directions leading to the same traffic jam, Mio. Situated at the bottom of one of the deepest valleys in Europe, the medieval town yeah, that's that centered the yeah. ceramics trade in Roman times and with its roots back in the Bronze Age, must have always been a difficult place to get to, through, or round. In the 20th yeah. century, it was on the most popular holiday route in the country, Paris to the Mediterranean, and regularly ah. it suffered five or six hour traffic jams throughout July and August. The high-speed routes to the north and south stopped short of the chasm that was the town valley. How Damn, I'm sorry. I just love this bridge terrain. The this is a beautiful area. Yeah, I've wow. occupied the minds of planners, engineers, and architects for the best part of two decades. Four possible routes were considered. The road could bypass Mio to the east, crossing the Tarn and the Doobie rivers on to very high bridges with spans of 800 and 1,000 meters respectively. Wow. These posed technical problems, but the main objection to this route was that Mio would basically be virtually cut off from the outside world. Yeah. The bypass to the west was technically easier, but more expensive and 12 longer. kilometers longer. The yeah. main drawback to this solution was the adverse impact on the environment, a factor that was particularly important considering the spectacular beauty of this area. Yeah, a third suggested route was area. rejected because of its possible impact on future plans for the area, leaving the fourth possibility also to the west of Mew, crossing not only the river but the entire valley of the Tarn as the preferred route. This could be accomplished in one of two ways, a descent into the valley followed right. by a bridge, a viaduct and a tunnel, or the seemingly impossible, a 2.5 kilometer smokes. long viaduct more than 200 meters above the river. They chose Jeez. the impossible. Look at how small the cars look. They look like they look like ants, like little bugs. This kind of thing is just amazing when you see it. I mean, this is on video. I bet this is in, like incredibly huge in person. I'm sure the view from up there is insane. Uh, it, it uh, to be honest, it's so big. It almost looks weird seeing that beautiful landscape and this like kind of just slapped right in the middle. But it, it is the aesthetic of this structure is very interesting, right? Pure white and then just the huge supports going all the way down. Like this is crazy, man. Wow. I, it would be a little freaky to drive on, I think, if you're like afraid of heights, yeah? Fresh it's, from the ooh. success of his <laughs> Pond de Normandy, at the time the longest cable stayed bridge in the world, Dr. Michelle Virago had ambitious plans for Milo. While the Normandy Bridge had cable stays on both sides of the road deck, his concept for this viaduct had just one central set of stays that would be carried by not two, but nine piers right across the valley from oh, the oh, plateau oh. on one side to the plateau on the other. Wow. Unwilling to take a chance on one man's ideas, the French Roads Administration announced a competition for architects and engineers to come up with a practical design. By July 1993, the applications by 17 engineers and 38 architects had been whittled down to eight structural engineers and seven architects to study the problem. Between them and an independent panel of experts, they came up with five general design ideas by February 1995. The competition was relaunched with five engineering slash architectural partnerships doing in-depth studies of the selected approaches to the problem. And in July of 1996, the multiple span cable stayed viaduct proposed by the structural engineering group Sogolog, Europe Etudes, Getzi, and Surf with British architect Lord Norman Foster was selected. Foster <laughs> had taken Villago's concept even further into the realms of the impossible by cutting the number of piers to seven and making them even slimmer. 
The basis wow. of his thinking was to take an inventive piece of engineering and turn it into a work of art, something that would have- Yeah, you know, I have to say for how big it is and considering it goes across this huge valley and is really high up, I, I guess I should have mentioned this sooner. It is very like a minimalist design. I mean, it's so like, the aesthetic is so bizarre on it. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like it could have been a lot more bulky and I guess industrial looking. Like this almost does look more like artsy, right? It's kind of a wonder that it's that long and that uh, I'm assuming this is safe, right? Like well built with seemingly like not a lot going on. <laughs> right? Rest lightly wow. on the incredible mountain landscape. The next two and a half years saw extensive studies being made so the intricate details of the design could be finalized. A geological survey showed that the fractured limestone coupled with a myriad of caves in the area Ooh. might pose a problem in the form of landslides, while an 18-month meteorological study showed that the winds being funneled through the gorge could gust up to 130 kilometers wow. an hour. Hurricane That's fast. forces. Wind tunnels led to alterations in the shape of the road deck and some detailed corrections being made to the shape of the pylons, but by late 1998, the final design was approved. The project went out to tender in 1999 and was awarded to, uh, my French pronunciation I know, Compagnie Effage du Viaduc de Milo. Now, all they had to do was build the tallest bridge piers in the world and put a 36,000 ton freeway on top of them. No worries. Oh, and that was just the starters. <laughs> then they had to erect seven steel pylons, each weighing 700 tons, wow. and secure the road deck with 5,000 tons of pre-stressed steel cabling. And they had to do it in under four years or face wow. a fine of $30,000 a day for, wow. for late delivery. Even four years. Put this together for years, make it look nice, and make it be safe. 30 grand a day if you don't get it done on time. Wow, that's a late fee and a half. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure at all, right? Yeah, this kind of thing, these projects like this, uh, I think are just a wonder because, like, I, as someone who's just a normal guy, like, I, I don't even know how this is possible, honestly. I mean, I get that it's just science and engineering and plans and uh, putting them to work and, and making something out of it. But it's just so big and grand. It's like, dude, how does this even like, how do you begin this, right? Like, tons wow. And secure the road deck with 5,000 tons of pre-stressed steel cabling. And they had to do it in under four years or face a fine <laughs> of $30,000 a day for late delivery. Even some of the engineers on the project had their doubts. Two yeah. weeks after the laying of the first stone on December the 14th, 2001, the workers started digging the shafts for the pilings, four Jeez. to each pier, 15 meters deep and five meters in diameter. The footings on top of the concrete pilings took another 2,000 cubic meters of concrete, and now progress began oh to show above God. the ground. Now Every three days, each pier grew by four meters. Then, because of the tapering design of the piers, the 15-ton mold had to be taken down and adjusted for the next pour. The concrete was being wow. manufactured on site, so a new layer could be poured every 20 minutes, and the speed of construction increased rapidly. Now, it was during this phase that geologists' fears were realized. A violent storm caused a landslide, and 4,000 cubic meters of rock were dislodged near the first pier. Fortunately, the pier wasn't oh. damaged, but manpower oh, had to be wow. diverted to stabilize the grounds and time was of the essence. Oh Construction continued with each team aiming its pier to an exact point in the sky. With no visual reference as to whether the piers were straight, the engineers right. relied on GPS using multiple satellite feeds to pinpoint the destination of the build. But That's what I was going to say earlier when I said like it's amazing that they can even build this in the first place. I was like how do they get these all lined up as straight as they need them and also get like them put in the ground correctly where they're not angled and leaning and like oh my god I, I just <laughs> this is like above my head man this is crazy by november 2003 the piers had reached their full height a month ahead of schedule and accurate to within two centimeters 
Meanwhile, Jeez. the steel company, Eiffel, founded by Gustave Eiffel of Eiffel Tower fame, was manufacturing the steel road deck. The 2,200 separate sections, each weighing up to 90 tons and some as long as 22 meters, then had to be transported hundreds of kilometers by road and welded together on site. The plan wow. was to slide the two colossal sections across the piers from either side of the valley <laughs> so they would meet in the middle. In the middle. Oh my goodness. This is a to stop the crazy, edge from crazy dipping project. And knocking down the piers, one of the pylons was installed on each section to hold the cable stays supporting the front of the deck. Temporary steel support towers were then placed at each halfway point between the piers to make the distance between them more manageable. Even so, the road deck would still have to be launched over greater distances than had ever been done before. Also, simply launching the sections over the edge by pushing them with hydraulic jacks was not going to work in the case of such enormous sections. The jacks would right. need a considerable amount of help along the way. The engineers designed a novel system of pairs of hydraulically driven wedges, four sets of which were installed on top of each pier. The upper and lower wedge of each pair pointed in opposite directions. Controlled by a computer so that they acted in perfect unison, the lower wedges were to slide under the upper ones, forcing them high enough to lift the road deck off of its supports. Both wedges wow. would then slide forward, moving the deck forward. The lower wedges would then return to their starting positions, followed by the upper wedges, leaving the deck 600 millimeters further along its journey. Then the four-minute cycle would be repeated. No launch had ever been done this way before, and there was wow. no chance to test the system. It just had to work. It just and had it to is. work. And everything went smoothly. Until six months into the launch when one of the launch systems fails. To make oh, matters worse, wow. the meteorologists were predicting a storm and the deck was in a vulnerable position with its leading edge <laughs> hanging out into space. Oh, the geez. engineers had underestimated the friction between the sliding surfaces of the wedges and the non-stick PTFE coating which had worn away. There were no spare oh parts for this impromptu design, but there were as yet unused pairs of wedges which were destined for the piers that had yet to be reached by the advancing deck. The team hastily stripped them of their coating and repaired the damaged units while the weathermen chewed their nails and monitored the impending storm. Oh, Disaster geez. had just been averted. The deck reached its next support safely. Wow, that's lucky. <laughs> Over the next months, the two sections of the deck edged towards each other. As each reached its next support, the teams breathed a collective sigh of relief and checked the weather forecast before pushing on to the next stage. Yeah. Things were going well, but there was still no guarantee that the two sides would meet in the right place. Even the slightest inaccuracy mm -hmm. could mean that they'd built the most expensive white elephant in Europe. The engineers installed a GPS <laughs> system on the leading edge of the section that was to make the final push so they could compare the actual position with their calculations. They now how freaky would it be once you're towards the middle? Picture, I guess, like the final two pieces. You're like, oh, if these don't line up, <laughs> this is all one big joke. Now that would be like horrible. The launch, bridging the river itself. Not only was this the <laughs> longest span of the viaduct, but it Look at that little bridge down there. <laughs> it's also the one place where it had been Jeez. impossible to erect any intermediate supports. The leading edge of the longer section launched across 342 meters of open space, and the teams held their breath as the suspense mounted, and the French Prime Minister was also due to drop by to see the event. No pressure. As the no edges pressure, got closer no. together, the tension eased. It looked as if it would be a near perfect fit. A magnum of champagne was positioned at the point of contact, and as it exploded, other corks were popped. Celebrations were in order because the discrepancy in the alignment was a matter of millimeters. Of course, wow. the project was nowhere near complete, but the first- Come on, how did they get it that accurate? That's very impressive. Wow. Two like major how? challenges, the piers and the road deck, had been successfully navigated, and they were still on schedule. Because steel is flexible, more so than some of them had realized, the road deck had an undulating appearance at this stage that was a bit of a cause for worry. Would the cable stays pull it straight, or had they run across another unexpected problem? 
Ancient techniques. Before their question could be answered, the remaining five pylons had to be erected. These 700-ton steel monsters had to be raised through 90 degrees and accurately positioned on top of the piers. To achieve this, they borrowed a 2,000-year-old technique from the ancient Egyptians, who oh. had used it to erect obelisks and piers at Karnak. While the Egyptians would have used slaves as their motive power, the 21st century engineers had the advantage of hydraulics to lift this massive weight. The principle was straightforward, as Archimedes summed it up. Give me a lever long enough on a fulcrum and I'll yeah. move the world. That's on top true. of the road deck. The it's really that simple. What gives you the most leverage? Science, baby. Get a fulcrum. Team put up two enormous <laughs> towers secured by cables and equipped with a hydraulic system capable of raising a thousand tons. As the hydraulics lifted each pylon, it pivoted slowly until it was vertical and could be lowered safely onto its anchoring point. With all seven pylons in place, the team attached the cables which supported the deck. As the tension on the cables increased, so the kinks in the road deck smoothed out, and another challenge had been met. There wow. just remained the finishing touches. The road surface added 10,000 tons to the weight of the deck, and just to be sure it was safe, they drove 36 monster trucks with a combined weight of over 900 tons onto the longest span. The distortion was negligible. On December the 14th, 2004, oh, President Jacques Chirac <laughs> formally opened the viaduct, and it opened to traffic two days later. This was almost Dang. a month out of schedule. Whoa. Okay, this crazy biggest like world's tallest bridge mega project that uh to be fair on paper looked a little bit optimistic <laughs> let's be real they had a lot of factors to battle here and a in my opinion pretty tight schedule you're telling me that this thing not only got done everything ended up lining up was structurally sound had a, had the good aesthetic and was ahead of schedule <laughs> wow bravo very uh, impressive. The construction of the middle. Was this just amazing work, or did it have a little bit of luck? Viaduct you may never broke know. several records. Two of the piers were the highest in the world. The pylon on top of the second pier was the highest bridge tower in the world. At 270 meters above the town, the road deck was almost twice the height of the previous European record holders. Critics of the project had said that the technical difficulties would be insurmountable, and the whole scheme was doomed to fail. And they were proved very wrong. Others said, I mean, that's always satisfying, right? I mean, there's always going to be naysayers in a lot of things in life. But, uh, I mean, when you can prove them wrong, it's like, <laughs> what now? Taurus. To be fair, I mean, yeah, this, a lot of people would be like, I don't know if this is going to happen. Would avoid the bridge rather than pay the toll fee. The project would never break even and toll income would never amortize the initial investment and the contractor would have to be supported by subsidies. They would be proved wrong the following summer. The Minot Viaduct was an instant success, and at the height of the tourist season, carried more than 60,000 vehicles per day. At eight wow. euros and 30 cents per vehicle, the viaduct would pay for itself in less than three years. Jeez. Oh my God. So, so this thing was basically a massive success, even uh, when we're talking financially. The Mio Viaduct, the world's tallest bridge. What a story, for sure. So I turn this to you guys. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts on this. And uh, most of all, have you been on this? Maybe even know someone that worked on this? What was that, 20 years ago about? Yeah, I would really love to hear about that. Uh, things like this are very interesting to me when you have something like, you know, the world's best, the world's biggest, whatever, right? It's uh, it's very interesting. And this, like I said, the static is very unique. For being so big, it actually looks minimal. It, it's very weird contrast, right? Uh, and then I tell you what, that area of France, drop dead gorgeous. Love it. Please throw a like on there if you learned something new. Subscribe to be part of this amazing community we have. We just passed 100,000 subscribers. Cannot believe it. <laughs> Love every single one of you. My name is Ian. You're watching IW Rocker. Until next time, y'all. Catch you later.